welcome to another episode of Phantom Knowledge. I have with me today Chris Litzkow. He is a police officer and he also is a Phantom 3 owner. So Chris is um, pretty knowledgeable of FAA and 333 certification. We're going to get into that, talking about the exemption for 333. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, I want my viewers to learn more about you, Chris. How did you get into... Um, you know, aerial Flying. photography and yes. Sure. Well, and thanks for having me, Jim, because I'm excited to talk about it. I have a lot of people who ask me multiple questions about the drones and the evolution that the FAA is taking here to deal with the mass number of drones that are in the skies. I got involved in flying RC aircraft uh, approximately three years ago and started off with small quadcopters and worked my, actually small helicopters, worked my way into a small quadcopter have uh, built several uh, kits from scratch and have now finally what I thought was switched to the dark side and went to a DJI, DJI Phantom 3 <laughs> professional, okay. it's sort of a mouthful, and uh, have been flying that for approximately the last six months now. So I really okay. enjoy the hobby. Uh, as Jim mentioned, I'm a police officer for a statewide police agency, so I do have some professional contacts with uh, drone operations as well, both on people who are hobbyists that want to fly in areas that are uh, beautiful to record at, but should be somewhat protected. And I also work with a lot of people in the law enforcement and search and rescue industry mm -hmm. who are uh, drone experts and fly the drones as, uh, as part of their profession. Now, you've actually been doing this for quite a while. I mean, more than just the six months, because it mm -hmm. looks to me like you've had other uh, UAVs uh, prior to the Phantom 3. I have, yes. Like I said, I had the small ones. I've uh, worked my way up. I built a TBS Discovery Professional. I had a Dialfonso uh, V-Tail. I've had uh, some smaller ones, the RCI Logger the RC Logger i1 Extreme, <laughs> uh, which I switched out to a carbon fiber kit, foldable uh, legs on that, very nice little aircraft with a camera. Okay. That was my first one with a HD camera attached to it. Okay. And uh, now with the Phantom 3, it's mm -hmm. been just another level of mm -hmm. autonomy and being able to fly further and mm -hmm. faster and higher. Well, it certainly is fun. Mm -hmm. So as a police officer, have you encountered anybody that was flying illegally or unsafely? Well, the term illegally is really the question that a lot of people have because it's really ambiguous as to what is legal and what is illegal. And some people agree and disagree. And my opinions that I have today are not representative of every officer or every agency or the FAA. I'm just speaking uh, as a knowledgeable hobbyist and somebody who's seen it from the law enforcement side of things. Okay. And so we do have people who question whether or not they can fly in certain areas. And the FAA has determined, as most people I think are aware by now, what the standards are for model slash hobby aircraft flight. You gotta fly under 400 feet, line of sight unaided, mm -hmm. uh, avoid other aircraft, avoid personal property, etc. Those standards are well documented online as well as the uh, AMA based community guidelines that the FAA recommends to follow. Uh, getting outside of that, we do have a lot of people who ask if they can fly, and to that they're going to get different answers from different officers. I'm, as a hobbyist, wanting to always tell people, yes, you can fly, because it's a fun hobby and it's something that I know that they enjoy doing. However, we do have to ask some questions to ensure that what their intentions are good, what their capabilities and skill levels are, what their understanding of their aircraft is, as well as uh, what their understanding of the laws are, their relationship to the airports, and uh, things like that. So sometimes I say yes, sometimes I say no, and sometimes I say fly at your own risk. I can't control what other officers may or may not do. What are some of the locations where people should, you've already mentioned airports, where are some of the other locations where people really should not be flying? Any type of national park is going to be prohibited airspace, any type of uh, military installation, any place that there is a temporary flight restriction is going to be a place that you should not fly. And I encourage everybody to download apps and 
to know your location, know where you are, and really do that before you invest in an aircraft. I see so many people online, Jim, that have just purchased a nice $1,500, $2,000 aircraft, and they fire it up for the first time and it tells them that they're in a no-fly zone. And they unfortunately live inside of a no-fly zone because Mm. they are close to an airport or a military installation or other type of area where there's a flight restriction. And that's very disappointing to them. And the first thing that they want to do is know how they can defeat that built-in fail-safe in the aircraft and fly anyway. And that's really not the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to educate yourself ahead of time Mm -hmm. and to know where you can and cannot fly. And there's a lot of apps. I use uh, an app called Hover, H-O-V-E-R, and that gives me a lot of good information. But also, I really think that people should explore their hobby, dig deeper into it, and learn some things to do with uh, aeronautical charts. And skyvector.com is a great website. It will show you a, an aeronautical chart of your area. Very difficult and complex to read if you've never looked at one before. I am a private pilot. I've had a pilot's license through the FAA since 2002. And so I understand those charts. If you don't understand those charts, spend 10 or 15 minutes online. There's a lot of tutorials that explain to you what all the symbols mean. And you'll be able to safely fly Uh, without endangering you, your aircraft, or uh, any other manned aircraft that are in the sky. So Chris, why don't you tell us about the FAA. Mm -hmm. Um, What is FAA, who are they, and what what do we need to know about them? Sure. So that's a really big question. And to just unpack that a little bit, as it would apply to this, the FAA is the Federal Aviation Administration and they are going to be the ones that regulate. Their primary responsibility is maintaining the safety of the national airspace. So national airspace is pretty much anytime you walk outside your house and you look up into the sky from above your trees and up, that's going to be the national airspace. And it's their job to ensure the safety of that. That's where you fly uh, your aircraft and it's where manned aircraft operate and it's uh, it's really up to them to make that a responsible atmosphere for everybody to to participate and have fun and do it safely. I've read somewhere that the FAA only has jurisdiction I think above 400 feet Mm -hmm. that anything below is not regulated by FAA? That is pretty much my understanding as well and I don't know that, uh, that that's been challenged. It's just not been applicable until now. Okay. And so generally speaking, the FAA doesn't care if you are flying an aircraft below 400 feet, unless you're in a restricted area sure. and certain classes of airspace, they will control it all the way down to the ground. Uh, however, in most areas, you go out to your local park, you go out to your backyard or your local flying field, if you stay below 400 feet, the FAA Uh is totally okay with that because you're really not posing much of a danger to any type of manned aircraft. The only thing flying that low is going to be helicopters at that 400 feet and above uh, altitude, and you're usually going to hear them.